um, let's jump straight in and talk what exactly is co-ownership and what does it entail? Uh, property co-ownership is when two or more people try uh, agree to own a property together. Typically, it happens in a marriage. You want to make sure... My name is Dumi and I am your host for tonight. This podcast focuses on everything and anything property. We talk about investing, buying, selling, and overall growing your, your property portfolio. So if that sounds like something you are interested in, do stay tuned. This is the best time to share the, the link of this live with friends, family, and anybody you think will benefit from the conversation tonight. Tonight we are talking about all things you need to know about property co-ownership. And I've got Skoko Sebela from uh, Leaping Frog Properties. He's going to be talking to us about the things that you can do, the tips, the tricks, and really just advising us on how you can go about property co-ownership. Skoko, good evening. Good evening to me. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Tonight we're talking uh, property co-ownership and we believe you are the best uh, in the industry to, to, to talk to us about this. So um, let's jump straight in and talk what exactly is co-ownership and what does it entail? Uh, property co-ownership is when two or more people try uh, agree to own a property together. Typically it happens in a marriage. But uh, of late, you find younger people, you know, coming together to buy properties. Sometimes even colleagues or family members coming together to buy a property together, you know, in order to alleviate costs and, you know, and get their foothold into the property market. Sure. And, you know, yeah, um, as, you said, well, as you said, as you said, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Great. So as you said, um, it's it's what, well, traditionally we knew uh, marriages or people who are in who are in a marriage setting to go into co uh, property co-ownership. Is it any different, right, when people are in a marriage to when there is more than just two people? Um, what are the intricate details that change um, it, it from just being a, a, a co-funded um, property to something, uh, to it being like having multiple owners? Look, uh, the main drivers has indicated that uh, to get a foothold into the industry. But uh, essentially, uh, it means people coming together, you know, to own a property. They don't particularly own a section or a portion of the property, but uh, they could have a varied shares depending on the agreement that they entered into. And there's normally a co-ownership agreement that one would advise uh, people who intend buying uh, property together get into you know, and really outline the details uh, of what uh, would be entailed in the co-ownership. Like, say, in a, in a townhouse complex uh, where you decide to buy a flat together, you know, there'd be levies, there'd be rates and taxes. So th those need to be stipulated uh, before uh, deciding to, to buy a property together. Like, details as to whether the property will be let or whether one of the co-owners will be occupying the property we have to go into the co-ownership agreement. But yeah, essentially it's when multiple people decide to own a property together. And we were just talking about that because um, when we're talking about the, the utilities and talking about the levies, is, is there a standard agreement that can be found or it, does the agreement solely depend on the people who are owning it or, or the people who are deciding to go into this partnership? Now, it, look, it mainly depends on the people who are going into, into that core property ownership. But if, if there isn't an agreement in, in place, you know, the law uh, presumes that uh, the co-owners have an, uh, equal shares in the, in, the, in the property. If there's two of them, then it'll be 50-50. If there's three of them, then it will be 33% and a third, and so on and so forth. Yeah. All right, so let's talk a little bit more also on the, um, the, the 
the disadvantages of this and um, advantages you touched on one or two so you can maybe delve deeper into that if there are any more advantages that exist into co-ownership because um, it's something that seems very lucrative but probably has disadvantages that people should should be aware of you know before they go into such an agreement so can you talk to us maybe about the the disadvantages and advantages thereof Look, maybe just to add on to the advantages, uh, one of the main advantages is shared cost. But uh, if you have to go into, into the cons, one would name, you know, if there's uh, multiple owners, you know, decision-making may take uh, a while as you have to go around all the co-owners before making a decision. Say maybe there's maintenance that needs to be made, or maybe you need to sell, you know, you have to be in agreement with everyone you know, on every, every decision that you make. And look, another disadvantage would be, say maybe one of the co-owners can no longer keep up, you know, with the maintenance uh, requirements, say, in terms of funds, or maybe they lose their job, you know, or maybe generally you find yourself in a co-ownership with somebody who's just difficult to co-own a property with, you know. Those could be some of the cons, yeah. And what, what does one do? You know, you, you just mentioned one that, that raised my eyebrows. You know, when you are dealing with somebody who's, who's already extremely difficult and maybe situations or just um, um, the circumstances make the person out to be that way. Um, are there any um, clauses that protect each, each owner or do these have to be built in by themselves or... Are there, are there things that protect each owner to ensure that at least um, people's interests are, are protected? Look, uh, your, your starting point is in that co-ownership agreement uh, where you need to stipulate all the eventualities. You know, so certain things are certain in life, like death is one of those. Those need to be stipulated. Maybe after one of the co-owners passes on, the remaining partner might want to keep the property. Or maybe one might want them to sell, and you know maybe the the, the proceeds of the owner that's passed on uh, carry on into the estate. But uh, yeah, the main thing that is to remedy would be through uh, mediation, uh, and mediation is mainly based on reasonable and fairness, you know. And if the parties fail to agree, ultimately, you know, mediation may require that the property be sold and uh, the shares uh, be distributed uh, equitably. Thank you for that. Um, you, you spoke, you're speaking about mediation now, and my next question is, um, who who facilitates this this process? Because normally we we normally have um, just uh, the, the lawyers that are involved in us um, facilitating the buying and the selling of a property. So are they are they separate to the people who will be helping us to acquire the property? Should this happen outside of the buying and selling process, or is this something that can be factored in when we are buying or selling a property? Look, there isn't like really a body that really is uh, designated to deal uh, with core property ownership. But there's, uh, you know, mediation through your uh, state agency affairs board, which sets up such mediations where there's disagreement. But if then even mediation doesn't really prevail, then it will ultimately lead to, to litigation. You know, it's a, it's a risk that one takes when you go into corporate property ownership. Because you never know how the future will play out, you know. But ultimately, it ends in the courts, even though is the last result that one would want to explore. No, sure. We spoke, yeah. No, it definitely does. We spoke a little bit about um, the kinds of property. Does this does this apply to all kinds of property? Can all property be bought in this way and managed in this way, or are there specific Certainly. categories? Yeah. Certainly, Go all ahead. kinds of properties you know, can, can be co-owned from commercial to residential, from rural to urban, you know, block of flats. You know, I know of youngsters who started, you know, a group of youngsters, say four youngsters come together, just getting into the job space. You know, they started with one townhouse and eventually end up co-owning 20 townhouses, you know, in the northern suburb, just from building one, you know, from one property and getting their food on it. So, yeah. No, no, no properties are off limits, you know? 
if you will it, you can do it. Sure. Um, I would just like to leech on to, to um, that story that you're about to say, to say, uh, just talk us through how this would potentially look, how how we would look um, specifically when it's a group of, of people who have come together and are leasing a property. Um, what are the steps that they would need to go through? What are the um, uh, finer details, you know, I'm, 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 I'm considering um, or I'm, I'm thinking about somebody who's watching this and who might possibly want to go into this. Um, what advice would you give them to say, this is how it would look, this is um, uh, particularly the things that you should look out for? Look, ideally, uh, if you come together maybe as colleagues or as friends, you'd want to set up a trust, you know, with all the, the partners' uh, names registered in the trust. And uh, you'd want to make sure that you vet all the partners that are going to be in the trust. You know, if they've got a regular income, if they'd be able to keep up with the maintenance of the properties as the portfolio increases. So it's almost like a, a stock firm, but you do it in a formal fashion. You know, you set up a trust and you have a co-property uh, co ownership agreement on the backdrop of that. And then you build them from there. Oh, nice. Um, you know, it's uh, you said something then, you said property stock fell, and I, I remember hearing um, a lot of this um, of late where people are talking about these things and um, are engaging in them a lot. If you just joined us, we are talking all things you need to know about co-property ownership or property co-ownership. And I would just like to thank our stars, as usual, on social media who are coming through, um, Martha, Paulina, and Tashi. Thank you so much. Colleen Janssen, good evening. Evening and thank you so much, guys, for joining us and for always coming through and dropping those green hearts and engaging in the comment section. You know, my 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 biggest question right now about this is to say um, this: the uh, the co property ownership. Um, does it uh, is it as lucrative as it looks, or are they major downfalls? And when when I mean major downfalls in terms of um, the exiting out um, or someone leaving in the in in the in the agreement that was stipulated in the beginning, does this mean that we need to now look for somebody to replace them, or how do we how do we look at those um, instances where now the person that or the initial group that was um, joined in is not is now no longer able to continue um, with the agreement that's stipulated? Look, lucrative definitely it can be. You know, it just depends on how the partnership uh, is structured. You know. Obviously, if you have uh, too many co-owners, the less profit you derive from that uh, co-property ownership. But uh, in, with regards to maybe terminating the co-ownership agreement or the exit loss, as you, as you call it, you know, mm. I refer back to the co-ownership agreement. It's important that you have a co-ownership agreement with all those details in place that, you know, trying to plan for every, any eventual scenario you know, like one wanting to exit because, you know, life happens. You find that uh, some get married and their partners don't want, to be, uh, don't want them to be involved in core property ownership. So there should be, there should be clauses in place that, you know, guide as to what happens then. If maybe the other partner can buy the other partner out or if maybe then they go out to market and source a partner to replace that partner. Or if then maybe then they agree that, okay, if one uh, wants to opt out, then they sign. You know, but yeah, it definitely can be lucrative. And there's also downsides, you know, if you, you, if you decide to co-own property in, in an area that's not so lucrative, you know, that actually maybe is on a downward spiral. And when the co-owners bought, you know, they didn't really do the, the, the background or due, due diligence on the, on the area they're buying into, you know. So that's why it's very key that before entering into any sort of agreement that you you do, you do your homework, you know, cross all, all the T's and dot the I's in terms of uh, researching the area that you're going into, uh, market trends in the area, what sort of people are buying, will you be able to attract tenants, you know? Yeah, so all, all goes back to the co-ownership agreement so that, you know, if there's any pitfalls, they can be remedied by the, by the co-ownership agreement. 
you, I love the fact that we're really talking about this co-ownership agreement because it seems like it is the it will be the Bible that really governs um, this relationship that's going to happen. And I would like to now ask that outside of the the co-ownership agreement, what other things um, should we look out for? Because we are now think we are now looking at stuff like um, you own a property, you know, they, there's there's municipal um, rates, taxes, levies in the complex, and there there might be other things like maintenance. And um, just the other day we were talking about how to winter proof um, a home you know approaching winter so with things like that 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 may not at the at the time sit um, in the in the agreement that was made initially how do we then solve for those um, outside factors look uh, co-ownership agreements are based on reasonableness reasonableness and fairness you know and if the co-ownership agreement uh, stipulates that uh, all have to chip in when, you know, maintenance comes up, you know, within reason, of course, you might find that one partner thinks he's too early to do maintenance. And one thinks that we really need to do maintenance now to maintain the upkeep. But it always goes back to reasonableness and fairness and detailing uh, those eventualities in the agreement. You find, like, say, in a townhouse complex, again, you find there is a special levy, you know, which uh, the co-owners don't really have a say in because it will be based on the general consensus of the owners in the complex that it's time, it's due. So if you have somebody as a co-owner that re really doesn't agree with you on such things, then it makes co-ownership really very difficult where you find yourself where there's really no remedies other than to opt out of the document. But yeah, goes back to, you know, stipulating any finite details, like as to maintenance, because maintenance, you know, it's something that's bound to happen. You know, painting every number of years, you know, maintains the value and the upkeep of the property. So those details should be talked about and signed on in, in prior to going into a ownership agreement. Sure. Thank you so much, Skoko, for giving us um, your time and giving us such great insights for us to be able to make decisions and ultimately attempt to grow our property portfolios. Thank you so much and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. So that was about it around uh, co-property ownership. So if you are looking um, at owning a property or in increasing and growing your, your, pro your, your property portfolio, this may be the way to go. But before you do that, ensure that that, that co-ownership property agreement is in check. Make sure you vet the people that you're going to go into that agreement with. And as, as our guest said, it is like going into a marriage. Just make sure that you're going in with the right person who will be able to honor their agreement and ultimately help you to make those decisions. The reason why we would go into it into something like this is to create um, and uh, to create a legacy and grow our portfolio. So let us ensure that it does exactly that. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for tonight's episode. It has been an absolute pleasure. And if you were also joining us on the Twitter spaces, thank you so much. Or right here on Facebook, do ensure that you have a good evening. And we shall see you same time, same place, right here on the Private Property uh, Podcast. <laughs>